has anybody ever given you advice regarding marriage? A lot of folks give advice about the subject of marriage. And uh, so since we had Valentine's Day this week, it may be good to talk a little bit about marriage. And we've been talking about possessing our inheritance in Christ And one element of that is possessing your marriage. Some of you are going, yeah, I'm married to someone that's possessed, all right. No, 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 no. No, I'm talking about us claiming the fullness of what God intended in our lives. So as I was thumbing through looking at some of that advice, I thought I'd share a little bit of it with you this morning from people who have been pretty well known through the years. One of those was a guy who lived a long time ago, Socrates. Here's what he said, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. (laughs) Rita Rudner, I love being married. It's so great to find that one special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. (laughs) This is anonymous. (laughs) The most important four words for a successful marriage, I'll do the dishes. (laughs) Many Many a man in love with a dimple makes a mistake of marrying the whole girl. (laughs) Stephen Leacock. That one will kind of soak in after a while. Then there's another one here. Ogden Nash, marriage is the bond between a person who never remembers anniversaries and another who never forgets them. (laughs) (laughs) Marriage is not just spiritual communion, it's also remembering to take out the trash. That's Joyce Brothers. Rita Rudner again, men who have a pierced ear are better prepared for marriage. They've experienced pain and bought jewelry. Irma Bombeck, that's a name from way back. Marriage has no guarantees. If that's what you're looking for, go live with a car battery. (laughs) If you want to know how your girl will treat you after marriage, just listen to her talking to her little brother, Sam Levinson. Many people spend more time in planning the wedding than they do in planning the marriage. That's the guru Zig Ziglar. Well, that's a true one, isn't it? And then I don't know who this one should be credited to. I just know that this is probably the most profound of any of those kind of statements. Which do you prefer? Do you prefer to be right or do you prefer to be happy? I noticed it was a female who said prefer to be happy. And I'm sure that's for us guys. But I want us to talk today about this very important subject because how many of you know that a marriage just doesn't happen? If you've been married, if you are married, you know that it requires effort. It requires involvement and commitment from both people. The old saying, it's a 50-50 proposition is so far from the truth. It's a 100-100 proposition. Uh, It's something that both people better be sold out to if you want the fullness of what marriage was meant to be. Proverbs has some great words about how you build the relationship and you build the marriage. Chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. How do you build that kind of house that Solomon's talking about? How do you build and how do you furnish a home that is going to have the blessings of God, that is going to be what God intended for it to be, and for it to bring the fulfillment into your life that was meant to be? Because marriage was ordained by God. It was intended by God. It's a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. 
Uh, Jesus is the bridegroom, and we are the bride of Christ as believers. And so, if we look at then how do you do that? How does it play out in the real world of where we live? There's several things that are very important. How many of you know that if you buy a piece of property and you plan to build a house on it, the very first thing you do is you need to clear the ground that the house is going to set on. You know, if there's trees, you got to get them out of the way. If there's other things that are there, they have to be removed because the house can't just be built around or over those things. Well, it could, but it'd be kind of awkward and probably wouldn't look real good. If it's going to be what it should be, it has to be built in a place that's been cleared so that it can have the best presentation. And the same thing is true for us. We have to clear the ground in our lives that relationship can be built on. I can remember from the time I was a little boy, I wanted to be married. I I always thought that would be a great thing. And uh, as an adult, I still believe that. And after all these many years, I still believe it. And after these last seven years of being married to Grace, I believe it even more. That marriage is a good thing and that it is something that is very fulfilling in our lives. But you have to have the ground clean. How many of you know that if you want to build something and they do an environmental study of the property and they find that there's toxic substances, you're not going to build on that property till those are removed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of renovation that's, that's happening in our downtown area in Fort Wayne. It's all pretty exciting. And uh, if you hadn't seen just a few days ago, uh, there was an announcement that Do It Best is going to be in that whole complex that's being redone of the old GM, or not GM, GE plant that was downtown. So, Corbin, we're all going to come to lunch with you when you get moved down there and then go to a ball game. So, uh, it's just really neat what's happening. And one of the places that's going to be developed as a new development is the big parking lot that's right there by Headwaters Park, by where the pavilion is and the skating rink in the winter. And have they, has it been cold enough for that to be a skating rink this winter? Oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a big ice skater, so I wasn't sure. But uh, between that pavilion and Club Soda is a big parking lot that's been there a long time. Well, that's going to change in the next few years because that's going to be replaced with a whole new development that's going to have apartments and condos, I think some businesses in it, and it's going to totally reshape that corner and that intersection. It's going to be a nice part of the, of the whole redevelopment of the downtown. You know, the one thing is true, though. No matter what they do to the downtown around it, the rivers are still going to be a little dirty in Fort Wayne. It's just the reality of of farm land and and water. But one thing I read is that development that's going to go in in that parking lot, they're going to have to dig down, I believe it's 10 feet, and remove all the ground because of toxic things that are in that ground from the past. The interesting thing is, even below that, there's more toxic things, but supposedly those are far enough beneath the surface that they're never going to be a problem. And I I remember thinking to myself, famous last words. Uh, You know, 10 years from now, we may be hearing that the people who live in those developments are smelling strange things in their house, and somewhere there was a sinkhole that they didn't get filled when they did all that. That's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? But uh, anyway, you just don't know what may happen down the road. So they're going to have to clear all that out because to build this new beautiful edifice, if they don't clear the toxic waste underneath it, it will create problems. And the problem is most people build marriages on ground that's toxic, that's never been cleared. Every one of us have things that have happened in our lives. We live in a world where there is a lot of a lot of focus on victims and being victimized. 
And while I believe that we shouldn't live under that because we've been set free by Jesus, it's a reality that there are things that have happened in every one of our lives somewhere in our past that has been painful. Every one of us have had painful relationships. I, I was such an awkward teenager. Some people would say you still are. You're just not a teenager anymore. <laughs> but the truth is that as a teenager, I, I was rather awkward. And I was so bashful. I remember going to a church camp. And I was about 12 years old. And there was this girl that was from Oklahoma City, a church in Oklahoma City, went to the Baptist camp that I thought was, forgive me, but I thought she was hot. And she was probably 15. And so I finally got the gumption, you could ask girls to sit with you in the church service at camp. I finally got the gumption to go up to her, and you, you can't imagine what it took for someone like me to even get the courage to do this. I finally went up to her, and I looked at her and I said, I know you probably wouldn't want to do this, but would you sit with me in the service tonight? And she said, no, I probably wouldn't want to. Uh, so I experienced rejection at a very early age. And I later learned, I hadn't heard of Zig Ziglar or any of these other people. I didn't know the right way to ask. I'm sure it would have been totally different if I had gone up with a very positive approach to her. But, you know, that, that left its mark. More seriously, there were things that were challenges that have happened in my life that have impacted, that have created toxic ground in my soul that had to be dealt with. And because we live in a world where there's toxins being spilled all the time, we still have to deal with that kind of toxicity in our world and in our lives. And probably the very fact that we live in a world that is so obsessed with sensuality, so much of which is sin sinful, we have a challenge of how do we cleanse ourselves in such an impure world. Those of you who are old enough to remember this, and for those of you who are younger, there used to be some shows on TV, and I Love Lucy was one of those shows. And they would show pictures of that couple in their house, and on TV, they always made sure there were twin beds in their bedroom because the thought of showing a couple in a bed together just would have never been considered to be acceptable in the 1950s when television was really coming into full, full view. How many of you have either remember those or you've seen them on reruns where that's, that's how a bedroom was set? Now, fast forward to today's world, and uh, it's a little bit different. I don't think I've seen a twin bed on television in 50 years. And the activities that show on just regular shows that are everyday shows today that your kids can watch, there are all kinds of sex scenes that are shown. And now we're moving into the day as the world continues to shift as far as same gender sex and all the other things that are a part of our current world. That's even shifting more. And when you live in that kind of a world... You get impacted by it. And if it wasn't enough that that's true on television, now we have the internet. And uh, it, it's been amazing to me when you look at ads that will pop up if you're Googling, if you're looking at Facebook, all the different places where ads pop up that with just one click you could be at a place that you shouldn't be. And even in the news, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that frequently in the news, they'll have news stories about some actress, and they'll talk about, can you believe at 50-whatever she's dressing like this, and it'll then have a picture of her in a bikini. And that's one click away. Now, is that just the most horrible thing in the world? Probably not. But nonetheless, 
Does that make you think godly thoughts as a man if you're a normal man? Probably not. Because we are all wired to be affected sensually. God intended it to be a good thing. He intended that to be a strong thing that bonds a couple in marriage. But we live in a world that has so twisted all of that that for all of us, there is a lot of toxic ground that interferes with us being prepared for healthy relationship and for us to not have it affect us when we are even in a healthy relationship. And so it's important that we clear the ground. And, you know, there's just many, many different ways that this can come at you. It's not all pure pornography. Sometimes it's things that would be considered acceptable. How, how many, well, I won't go there. I started to say, how many of you have ever read a Harlequin romance? Uh, I haven't read many of them. I read enough just to know. I, I wondered why people read them, so I one time thought, I'll read one. Dear God, deliver us. <laughs> but, you know, there's some steamy pages in those books. Everywhere we turn, it's being thrown at us. And we live in a world that all of that creates in our minds, in our souls, impressions that has to be cleansed because it will affect us. It will impact us. And, and you, you don't want to live in a bubble, and yet at the same time, we need to understand that we do get impacted by what our senses observe, and we need to allow God to cleanse us on a regular basis of how that needs to be and what it should be. The other thing is in cleansing us, it's not just from those kinds of things. It is also cleansing us from improper relationships that we've been exposed to, that we've been around. You, you know, you may have had the blessing of having a, a family where your parents were model parents, where both of them did what a couple should do in a marriage, where it was just a wonderful experience, and God bless you. But for most of us, we grew up in homes where there were challenges in marriages where a lot of times everything wasn't what it should have been. And, and, and so many people in today's world grow up in broken homes where they don't actually grow up with their biological parents. And, and you add in the gamut of step parents and everything else that gets involved in the world that you and I live in today. All of that impacts how we believe relationships ought to be conducted and how we get shaped in what we've observed of relationships being conducted. All of that becomes toxic ground that we have to have God clear us of. It's amazing and just sad that frequently people who abuse people were abused themselves. It's amazing what happens in that. And so you and I live in a world that has all kinds of stuff that needs to be cleared out. And God needs to work in us. The good news, this isn't a depressing message. The good news, Jesus came. And he brought the answers and he brought the way for us so that we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. So that we can be made new in him. So that his blood is a continuous flowing stream that continues to cleanse us. But it's important that we do that so we keep the ground cleared to build what needs to be built in the relationships we are in. And, and then another thing that happens is there are times we need old soul ties broken. Uh, there are stories and there are people who meet. I've even heard of stories where, where a couple were in the hospital, in the nursery at the hospital together. So they knew each other basically their whole lives. They got married and they lived happily ever after, or so they say. Uh, and so there are those kind of stories. But for most people, the relationship they end up with in a marriage is not the first person that they entered into a serious relationship with. 
And if you've been through the experience of death of a mate and remarriage or divorce and remarriage, then that is even a little more complicated. Or in our world where we have become such a promiscuous society and culture, frequently people who have had relationships where they've lived with someone or they've been sexually active prior to marriage, all of those relationships create a challenge in how we're prepared for the marriage we're going into. Because when you are in relationship with someone, when you move into the intimacy of a relationship that becomes a dating, and especially as it becomes a physical relationship, you create connections with that person, and you create what we frequently would call soul ties. So that that's where most of the connection ends up taking place in most relationships. It wasn't how God intended for it, and we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. But that's what tends to happen. And so it's important that we allow God to clear out the soul ties in our lives that have come from past relationships so that we don't carry those things into a relationship with our partner and so that we can be set free from what God has done. Now, here's the good news. You may have been married for 40 years and you've never cleared the soul ties from your past that were prior to that. It's not too late. Allow God to cleanse you from those things if you've not done it already. Just ask him to set you free from the things that you allowed yourself to become attached to and to free you and to bring you into a closer bond in the relationship that you are in with that person you're married to. And whether you're not yet married but you're going to get married or whether you've been married six months, six years, or 60 years, that can still take place if it hasn't. That's the great news today. He is able to take and wipe out the things from the past. Now, one of the things that I will say to you just as a matter of practicality, if you've been married 40 years and you had soul ties to someone prior to that, you need to pray and you probably need to seek some really godly counsel there may be wisdom that you clear that out with God. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to go to your mate and say to them 45 years ago, because at this point, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot to them. And sometimes you can create more damage than you can good. So you need wisdom in how you do that. And there's going to be times that it does need to happen. But God can guide that, and you can have godly counsel to help you determine. Is that something that the only way it's going to clear out is to address it? And if it is, then God will help that to happen. But it's important that we get rid of toxic ground. And then it's important that we understand that, that in building together in a relationship, that we begin to look, if we're going to clear the ground for what a relationship should be, we need to make sure that we have some core values that we hold as important to us, that no matter what, this is a value in my life, and that as a couple, you have core values that you have determined these matter to us as a couple. These are essential to us living the life that we're supposed to live. I, I will tell you, when, when Grace and I first met online, I am so thankful that we didn't meet in person immediately because it gave us opportunity to have a lot of understanding of what each other's core values were because of the series of emails that we exchanged that uh, I have actually gone back and read a few times because we have them all printed out and it's a big volume of, of material of things that we ask each other to try to know and understand each other better before we got married because we wanted to make sure that we really did share values that were important enough for us to spend our life together. And I'm so thankful that we did that. Uh, one of the things that 
drew me to grace was her mission statement that she had written long before she met me of what mattered to her, what was important to her. And it's important that you learn that about your mate and you learn that about yourself and determine what are the values that you're going to come together with. And it may not be a bad idea for you as a couple to sit down and say, let's have a mission statement of what our life is going to be about, what really matters and how we're going to live this life, who we are, who we're going to become, how we allow God to bring us together so that we can be the people God wants us to be. Now, when you begin to do this, there's another element that has to be done to clear the ground for you to build a great marriage, and that is letting go of expectations. Have you had any expectations that got crushed along the way? Things that you thought this is how it would be? I will tell you this. This boy was raised by a mother who did everything. So it it took me a while to understand that I had any responsibilities when it came to stuff around the house. My mother even carried out the trash when I was a kid. Some of you women quit glaring at me. (laughs) If you don't like what you see, God's not finished with me yet. (laughs) But Grace can tell you, I'm working on it. But I will tell you, there are things that you walk into as expectations because of what you've experienced what you watched your parents do or not do, what you vowed that because you watched your parents do or not do, you wouldn't do, things that you thought, everybody thought, and it can be as simple as uh, if you, how many of you, how many of you, this is a survey that I'm going to do right now. If you roll the toothpaste from the bottom of the tube, And always make sure that you're starting from the bottom of the tube and rolling up. Raise your hand. Now, how many of you, when you're ready to use the toothpaste, just take it and squeeze? Raise your hand. And some of you rollers and some of you squeezers are married to each other. And it affects your rolling and your squeezing as a couple, too. You see, expectations. Now, that one is pretty simple. It gets even more complicated when you look. Let's just for a minute talk about money. (laughs) If you were honest today, are you a saver? Raise your hand. Are you a spender? Raise your hand. If you're a good mix of both, raise your hand. If you're a liar, raise your (laughs) hand. (laughs) But you see, when it comes to money, the problem you have, it's a good thing if a couple gets together and one's a saver and one's a spender, as as long as they balance that in each other. Because the saver will keep the spender from spending them into oblivion, and the spender will keep the saver from wearing clothes that were worn out 20 years ago. And out of style 30 years ago. So it's all part of the practical of how do you deal with those things that create expectations. Because if you're a spender, you have expectations of what you're going to do. And if you're a saver, you have expectations. Furthermore, whether you're a spender or you're a saver, if today as you were leaving the building, Wheaties was out there handing out $100 bills to everybody that leaves today. Probably ain't going to happen, but if it did. (laughs) And you as a couple walked out, and each of you had $100. Would you agree to pull it so that you have $200, you're going to do something together? Or would one of you look at the other one and say, that's your 100 this is my 100 I'm going to do what I want to do with it. And would you do the same things with it? It'd be all over the map. Because that's just how God made us. 
But the problem is all of that gets us expectations. And because of that, when you come into a marriage, if you don't deal with that, those expectations will get you into trouble. You know, uh, uh, Gary Chapman put it into a book, The Love Languages. We all have different ways that we want to receive love. And we have different ways that we give love. And generally, we give love the way we want to receive it. Because wouldn't everybody think that way? What's wrong with you if you don't? Right? So what happens is if yours, I mean, he, he put them into five categories, quality time, physical touch, gift giving, acts of service, and words of affirmation. I, I've told this story many times, so I won't tell the whole thing. I'll just say it's number 38 of my stories. But first time Grace and I actually met, I was so sure I was going to just just knock her off her feet because I went to the brands. And I probably spent more money than I've ever spent on one thing in my life. Because I bought a box made out of chocolate, full of chocolates from the brands. Now, in my opinion, I was ready to ask her if she would marry me because her heart would be so set up when she got that box of chocolates. Was I ever wrong? Because I am bothered to find out what her love language was. And it, there was a good thing that came out of it. She learned that she, she really does like dark, dark chocolate out of that experience. But it took her coworkers that afternoon who immediately, they, you know, they're from Holland, Michigan. They'd never heard of the brands. It took them going to the website and looking and, and beginning to get an idea of how much money I'd spent. And they said to Grace, you better be nice to him. It did work, but it was sure a roundabout way of getting there. But what I learned with that is that's not necessarily the way that I'm going to get Grace's attention. I had to learn what matters to her. And she had to learn what matters to me because that's where you begin to build relationship so that those expectations get tempered, but where you care for each other in ways that ministers to the other one's need. All of that clears ground for good relationship. Second element is building the foundation. And it's pretty simple. The foundation of every marriage and everyone's life, whether you're married or not, needs to be Jesus. Amen. It's important if you're going to build a strong marriage that you each establish a strong personal relationship with Christ outside the other one. Now, if you enter a marriage where you marry an unbeliever, that doesn't mean they'll never come to know Jesus or that you're never going to have a great marriage any more than if you have two believers who get together, but they're not both really living the fullness of what it means to follow Christ, they're not going to have that great a marriage even though they're both believers. What's important is to understand that if marriage is optimized, if it's at its optimum capability, it is when you have two believers who have so embraced Jesus in their life that he is what is number one for them as an individual and then they live to that full potential without any coaxing or persuading from the other person. That's where it comes at the highest level. Now, please understand something. I know that that's ideal. That's not always reality. And if your reality is different from that ideal, that doesn't mean God isn't still working and that God can't bring it to that ideal. What you do is then live your end of it to the ideal. The reason this becomes so important and the reason this is needed for foundation is because God intended for marriage to be a relationship not just between a husband and wife, but if you think about it, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you look, there are so many things that God did that involves, he created us, spirit, soul, and body. And so marriage he created in a way for it to be the perfect relationship between Christ and two believers. 
because Ecclesiastes tells us a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And especially if Christ is wound as one of those cords or one of those strands, and then he's very much intertwined into the other two strands. Then it begins to be obvious why this becomes such an important thing. And it's so important that you and I recognize that we were meant to live in a marriage where that we have that value and we stand together in our relationship with Christ and that we have our individual relationship with him, but we also now have a relationship that creates in our marriage that takes us to a different dimension because then we can begin to live from our spirits, which is what God intended for the marriage to be about, so that as we live from our spirit, then our soul and body can get in alignment with what the spirit is. So many people get married, and frequently the first joining together is the body. Uh, it'll, it'll be a physical relationship. And it'll come out of soul connection. You're attracted to that person. You find some kind of attraction that draws you to them. And then, hopefully, the spirit somewhere connects in that. And that's one reason we have so many problems in our world today is because that's how so many relationships have begun. And if that's how your relationship began, don't despair. Determine with God's help that you're going to reset it, that you're going to re-engage in a new dimension where you do set the proper order, where it is about relationship spiritually that then begins to come into the dimension of the soul, the intellect, the will, and the emotions, and then the physical relationship. And all of that comes in alignment with the spirit and with that triune relationship with Christ. That must be foundational if we're going to have the full potential. And then what happens is when we begin to build on that foundation, we begin to understand why God brought us together. Do you remember when Adam was in the garden by himself? What did God say? It's not good for him to be alone. He won't be smart enough to come in out of the rain. He needs someone who can help him. He needs someone who makes up the difference that is missing in him. And when you begin to look at that picture of what God intended for relationship, that's why God frequently brings people together who are not just alike. Yes, there's common ground. There's things that you share together. There's common interests. There's common attractions. But very frequently, there are very strong differences. To begin with, it's a difference of a man and a woman. I'm not going to go into a whole long thing on that today. But it's a Christian faith understanding. Marriage for me will always be one man, one woman, and God. Other people can do what they want to do. That's their decision. But as for me and my house, marriage is a man and a woman connected through Christ. And when I look at that, then what I look is what do I do to both value and leverage the differences so that the foundation is built where the differences don't separate us but rather where they bring us together so that we have the ability you know I, all of my adult life before I met Grace I had always done all the bill paying and and keeping track of money and then I started dating this CPA did my world change? Grace can probably tell you how much gum that I chewed this week. I couldn't. She may not be quite that detailed. But I tell you what, she has a whole different perspective on managing finances. I'd be nuts to be doing that myself when she's willing to do it and she does an incredible job and she gives me an allowance. <laughs> She actually trusts me with a couple of credit cards. They just have to be paid off at the end of the month. So the truth is that we've learned to take differences and take advantage of those. And we've also learned to be there for areas where the other one may have weakness, that the other one has strength, and that we build on that so that the things that 
cause us to be different actually work for us, not against us. And it increases the potential of who we can become as a couple when we learn how to operate in this fashion and that becomes foundational to our lives. So we build that foundation on Christ in that relationship and then it's next about raising the walls which are communication. How many of you know that we sometimes have trouble communicating? We could play that old game where we started up here at the front corner and I could go over to Nancy and whisper a sentence and then have her whisper to Christy and she could come over to Pam and just keep going all around the building and come out over here and have uh, Tonya be the last person on this end. Long before it got over here, it would start changing. And by the time it got here, it might be a totally different sentence than what I went and told Nancy. Have you ever been at a party where you played that game? It happens. Because there's several things that goes on in us trying to communicate. There, there's first of all what was said. There's what I meant to say. What I thought I said. And what I actually said. And then you add in to whoever I said that to... It is, what did they hear me say? What did they think I said? What did they think they heard? And out of that, you come out with what actually happened. And that's why there are times where Grace and I will look at each other with kind of a blank stare because what we both thought the conversation was about was not where it turned out. And that happens to everybody. That's just life. And communication is a challenge for us. And so we have to learn how do we communicate in an effective way. And because we live in a world where sin has caused so much damage and so much injury, it is so easy for us to get injured. How many of you somewhere sometime this week had some person offend you? Raise your hand. Anybody that you didn't, could I be the first to offend you this week so you'll fit in? Because we all get offended. Now, I won't go there with shows of hands, but how many of you this week were offended by your husband or wife if you're married? Don't raise your hand because you're going you're gonna to add to the offense now. But it happens. It's just part of what happens in relationships in life. And so, one of the things we have to do is we have to build communication where we choose to not live from being offended. And then when we get offended, we deal with it. We process it. We allow God to work that. I, I am so grateful that Grace understands what I'm talking about and she lives it. Because I can tell you, and this is going to come as a great shock I can tell you that there are times I say things that offend her. <laughs> and furthermore, there's times that I don't even know I did it because <laughs> it just comes out of my mouth. And I've watched this dear wife of mine on so many occasions process it and come back in love. I have paid for it a few times before I make her sound too good. <laughs> But we've had to deal with getting offended with each other because it happens. And if you're going to have good communication, you have to determine, I will not live offended. It's important that you also learn the significance of listening. That's a challenge, isn't it? How many of you have ever, well, I want, you know, I keep having you raise your hands. I'm getting you all in trouble today. But has there ever been a time where you've been in a good fight with your spouse? Or you may not be married and you've been in a good fight with somebody else. And while they're talking, you're not listening to what they're saying. You're thinking about what you're going to say when you get the floor again. Ever do that? Because if you were really listening to them, you might not say the same thing you're going to say. But man, it's so good, i got to get it in. Have you ever had that happen? Our problem is we're better talkers than we are listeners. And it's important that if a couple is going to develop strong relationship, that you raise walls that insulate and protect, not separate and divide. 
that you make sure you're both inside the walls of the communication you're having. That you're not talking to the wall, you know, talk to my hand. You're not engaged in a way that the other person's not hearing so that you can work through what needs to happen. And it's important to understand, and you'll hear me say this many times, too many times we live life thinking we've got to solve the problems we have. We have problems. Money can be a problem. But do you know the truth is, most of the time, money itself is not the problem. It's managing money that's the issue. And it's the tension of managing that money that you have to deal with because you're going to always be challenged unless you have an unlimited supply of money. You're going to be challenged because whatever level of money you make, you're probably going to learn how to spend at that level or more. It's just how we're wired. And so as a result, it's important that you learn how to manage the tension that creates. If you raise children, it, it, there's a lot of issues that happen with children that are not problems you can solve. They're tensions you're going to manage. If you, if you have more than one child, you know their personalities are different. And if you have three or four kids, they're all different. And so what worked with one kid may not work with another. So you're going to always be managing tensions in life, and there are some problems you're going to be able to solve, but you better be able to separate those so that you can keep communication clear, and you're not fighting over something you can't solve anyway because it's going to come up next month. You're working through how do you manage the tension of whatever that is. And then how do you build a safe harbor of fellowship? That's one of the things I'm so grateful that God has given me in my relationship with grace. Is we have a safe harbor of fellowship. We really do like to be together. We really do enjoy being together. I will tell you this. I have never in my life watched a cooking show or a show where the fashion world is having contests for who can be the best designer. Until I married Grace. And we, from time to time, we don't, she's not obsessed with those most of the time. Uh, <laughs> we don't watch them all the time. But you know what? I've even said to her, why don't we turn one of those on? You know why? I know she enjoys them. And I know that I can play games on my iPad while I'm watching it. I can do both. And I just enjoy being together in that setting and just enjoying fellowship. Now, here's the other thing. There are times when you need to turn the technology off and have fellowship with no interruptions. And then there's fellowship that goes to physical relationship, sexual relationship, all of that becomes a part of fellowship that will bring walls that put you in a safe place together and keeps things outside of those walls that would tear down and destroy the relationship. And then it's important that you secure with the roof of commitment. That when you get married... It's a commitment no matter what. Most of us make commitments loosely in our world. One of the things that, and I'll say this now because it's in the middle of the year and nobody will get offended with me. If you do, get over it. <laughs> when we do the cookouts at our house in the summer, you know one thing that can be frustrating is if we have 90 people sign up and 70 people show up. Because then you prepare for 90 people. Now, things come up. So don't, don't take me wrong. I understand that sometimes someone gets sick. Something you can't help happens. And that's a reality. But we live in a world where commitment is hard for us. Because there's so many things we have going on that it becomes easy to say, Oh, I was going to do that, but I can't do that today. Because... We just aren't locked down to, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it no matter what. And that's true all across the board. And it's not something that I think needs to change drastically. But I think there are some things we need to look and say, these do matter and they're not going to change. 
And one of those is the commitment that it takes for a marriage to be together. That you begin to look and say, I am committed to this relationship. And that begins with an old saying related to marriage. You leave and you cleave. Now I just say this, I'm going to step on this lightly and then I'm going to step back off of it. Guys, when you get married, leave your mom at her house. (laughs) There's a new number one moment in your life. And guys, we're not always the brightest bulbs in the box when it comes to those kind of things. Because we've been used to mom telling us what to do all our lives, so we just assume that's how it is. And we don't even know the cat dig she's making to the wife that we don't know because that's mama. Well, boys, let go of mama. And your wife needs to be number one in your life. And I won't leave you girls alone. If your daddy was the perfect daddy, don't throw that up to your husband. He ain't your dad. And you chose him, make him priority. Marriage is leave and cleave. Do you still love me? Okay. If you don't, you still need to leave and cleave. (laughs) Marriage is for better, for worse. It's not going to always go easy. That doesn't mean it's not going to always work out because God works all things together for good. But there are going to be times you're going to go through challenges. We didn't plan for our 10-year-old granddaughter to have a stroke. But I'm going to tell you something. I refuse to stop short of her totally healed as if it never happened. Because we're in it no matter what. And the same thing in the relationship of marriage. Whatever happens, you're in it. So here's the key. Husbands, Ephesians 5 tells us what to do, and it starts with us. Love your wife the same way Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He died for it. Some of us aren't even willing to do something we think she would appreciate because it's going to inconvenience us. The instructions that you received, men, I'm talking to me too, is Jesus laid down his life that doesn't mean that you need to go today and commit suicide what it does mean is that you need to die to your own desires if it's crushing something that your wife values how do you give of yourself to her in such a way That if someone makes a sacrifice, you're going to be the one who makes it. Because we tend to like the part of Ephesians that tells wives to submit to their husbands. And I'll tell you this, that only works in marriage where husbands have learned to die for their wife. Because if you are demanding her to submit in places you haven't died, you're wrong. You're taking Ephesians 5 out of context. Because the basis for the relationship begins with men loving their wives as Christ loved the church. And the actual command to women is to give respect to your husband and let me just flip it a little bit if your husband isn't dying like Christ died you still have responsibility to give him respect because he's holding the office of husband in your home and as you give him respect you're honoring what God said to do that doesn't mean in any of these situations that you live a life of dysfunction there's not a world of abusers and enablers that's ever okay with God. But what it does mean is that you live a life 
where as a wife you give respect. And then there's a verse in Ephesians that we usually don't want to read as men, and you ladies want us to be sure we read it. He did say to submit to each other. If you want to have a great relationship, learn the truth of submitting to each other where you both have the ability to work through what needs to happen, but you're both willing to let go of what you're hanging on that's different so that you are willing to submit for the good of the relationship. And when we do that and we have a commitment that we hold fast in, I'm going to tell you something, that's going to be a roof that's going to endure every storm life brings that marriage will make it you will hold on our dear Doris Romy is just a short ways away from going home to be with Jesus and Dale passed away was it last year it's been a little while he was 98 they've been married since in their early 20s and they're a couple who just were amazing to me because they still, when I'd go see them before he died, it was just so obvious how much they still loved each other. How much they were a picture of what I'm talking about this morning. And my prayer is to God that this would be a church filled with those kind of relationships. That we would be a church of having that kind of, because here's another thing. Let me take it one more step with this. Married couples in the church were also involved in being a covering to the singles in our church. Because as we live godly marriages, we bring coverage into their lives. And so we have a responsibility as a part of the body of Christ to live to the fullest of what God has called us to be. So that we can be presented to him as a bride without spot our wrinkle because you see the greatest marriage that has ever taken place is going to happen trumpet is going to sound and those of us who are alive and remained are going to join those who've gone on to be with the Lord and when we get to the other side we're going to spend seven years at the marriage supper of the lamb do you know what that is that's the wedding feast of Christ and his bride and we're the bride I don't know how to figure all that out or explain it. All I'm going to tell you is this. It's going to be a party that beats every party that's ever happened. It's going to be a celebration that's beyond imagination because it's going to be the perfect picture of the unity of what marriage describes as a picture in our human lives. So God help us to live to the potential of who we are. I want grace to come. If you haven't figured out by now, I really love this lady. And uh, I just want her to share some thoughts with you before we close today. Well, you know, this has been an amazing journey. And if you were here last November when Pastor Bill and I um, shared a series called Wilderness Strategies, you know that that sermon series was based on these past six and a half years of my life. And what it felt like I was entering into, a time where I entered into being unknown. And I shared a story that I will just call red paint. And it was a story of very early on, just months after we'd been married, how I had a very significant and very unpretty meltdown in our home. And it was one of a couple that uh, went on in those early years. But I just wanted to give an addendum to that story because this part I didn't share. You know, a couple days after my meltdown, I was in time of prayer. And that meltdown came because I was in an identity crisis. I didn't know who I was anymore. And so when I was praying, I knew God had called me to ministry a year earlier. And then I met Pastor Bill, and I kept asking God, so when is it time for my ministry? Because I'm here at home just doing household things and 
that's just not how I'm wired. When is it going to be my chance for ministry? And the Lord asked me a question. He said, can I trust you with my son? And I said, well, God, you know you can. That's why I believe I've been called to ministry. I love you. I love your son, Jesus. And he said, again, can I trust you with my son? And I said, God, you know you can. I'm giving my life to this. I left my home and my family and my community. And he said again, but can I trust you with my son? And I said, am I not hearing you or are you not hearing me? God, I said yes. And he held in front of me a picture of my husband. And he said, this is my son. This is your first ministry. This will always be your first ministry. You know, I had never experienced marriage with God as the head. I'd experienced marriage, but it was miserable. Not all of it. But I did not have God at the head. And see, I did not know how to do that, but God knew I needed to know how for what he was calling me into. You know, we don't love God first and then our spouse second. We love our spouse through the love of God. Through the love of God. And when we love our spouse, God receives it as love on his behalf. It would be a year later which was my second year here, still struggling, that my husband would come to me and he would say, I can't take this anymore. I can't take watching you in this much, in this much pain and this much suffering and this much anguish. He says, I am willing to step down from LifeBridge Church. He was willing to step out of his calling that God has placed on his life so that he could fulfill and let us walk into a, perhaps another calling. And you know what? God would have been okay with that because that is God's order. It's not ministry first. He is now committed to me first. And because he was willing to do that, and because he was willing to show me what it means to fight, and he fought for me, the marriage proposal was just the beginning. He taught me how to fight. And I got on my knees, and I said, God, thank you for giving me a spouse that is willing to fight for me and willing to give up what I know is a call in his heart. But now teach me how to fight. And that's when the real joy began in our marriage, as we entered into this. So the question is, is we, t we, we talk about becoming the one, marrying the one. I have probably a very unromantic view of marriage. I'm not a real romantic person. But I'm a loving person. And I don't believe you marry the one. I believe you become the one when you get married. And so how do you become the one? How do we become the one? I don't care if you were a believer before you got married or whatever circumstances brought you, but marriage is a covenant. And so if you are in a covenant, how do you become the one? And God showed me two things. And last week, Pam Thorpe actually gave me words to the second one. But the first one is you let the Holy Spirit be your guide. Because you know what? When it comes to Bill Campbell, I am the only woman the Holy Spirit is going to speak to to teach how to love him. That's our relationship. He's not going to speak to any other woman in this church. He's not going to speak to any other woman that my husband comes in contact with. He's going to speak to me. And if I'm willing to listen, I can know and learn how to love this man. But I have to be willing to listen. And likewise, when it comes to loving me, the Holy Spirit will speak to him. And I will tell you, he has spoken to him. It has taken supernatural grace and mercy in my life. But he has given him wisdom beyond measure. 
And for that, I'm so very grateful. So guys, if you're looking outside your marriage, don't think that the Holy Spirit is gonna speak to another woman like he's gonna speak to your wife. But wives, you've gotta be willing to listen. And likewise, men, if you wanna know your wife, don't let somebody else think they know her better than you do because you submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Number two is get over it. My friend Pam Thorpe had a revelation in the believer, the authority of the believers class and I loved it because I'd never really thought about it and I immediately put it in my phone because I have to give those triggers to me. But what do I mean by get over it? You know, when we say get over it, sometimes it's a flippant comment. You know, if someone's doing something, you say get over it. It's like you don't even care. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just a small thing. But in Ephesians 2, when Paul says that we are seated with Christ, everything is beneath our feet. So if you're struggling in your marriage, if you're struggling in who you are and your identity and your relationship, get over it. That's the revelation Pam had and that's the revelation I've been meditating on all week is any struggle that I have, any struggle that you have individually or in your relationship, get above it, get over it. You are seated with Christ. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, and there is nothing that you cannot get over together. And so I would like to ask, if you're married, if you would stand. And also, if you're someone who is single, and you would like to be married to stand. Because we don't become the one the day we get married. We become who we, we become the person that the person we want to marry would want to marry. And it begins and happens every single day. And I would like to ask my husband, Bill Campbell, to say a prayer over you. You know, it's a wonderful thing what God does. And when you submit to God, he works all things out. And uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, when God worked out for us what he called us to as a couple, uh, I was willing to let go of whatever it took for us to make it as a couple because I really do believe what I preached to you this morning. But I'm so thankful for what God did. And so now you're stuck with us for 100 years because Grace actually probably likes it better than I do being here. And today we want to pray and believe God. And I want to ask something. If, if you're a married couple, just uh, join hands with your marriage partner. And if you're not married today, would you look around you and see someone who is married and no I didn't wasn't going to say look around and find somebody and ask them to marry you I already tried that at youth camp Uh, but what I would like for you to do or if your spouse isn't standing with you is find somebody around you that is married together and just reach up and put your hand on their shoulder or whatever and just lay hands on them we're going to pray over every marriage in LifeBridge Church. And then those of you who are single, we're just definitely going to believe that God's bringing you into the fullness of everything that he has for you. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we do pray over every marriage in LifeBridge Church. And I pray, God, that you would cause all of us to be determined to live to the fullness of what your word says that we've preached this morning. May we not just give word of testimony to it. May we live it and our lives become testimony to the truth. And I pray you would bless every marriage, cause them to thrive, help us to get rid of toxins, help us to do what we need to do to build on the foundation, to raise the walls of communication, to hold fast with the roof of commitment. And that we will be strong in you. I pray for every person here today that's not married. That you would just be near to them. Help them to be prepared for whatever you may have for them. And that you would bring them into exactly the place where they're supposed to be if they are to be married. And I just thank you that you bring all of us to a place of contentment in you. No matter what our status is in life regarding marriage. And so I thank you that this year of 2020. 
2020 is going to be an amazing year of unity in homes and couples and family and in this family of Life Bridge Church. And we give you the glory and honor for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.